Now, back when I first got involved with the Birch Society, it was quite common that somebody like myself would refer to myself and others as a conservative. Right? Why would we say conservative? Well, there was a book called The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk. He's really the father of modern conservatism, and he wrote his book in 1942. Then there was Barry Goldwater, who was known as Mr. Conservative. He wrote The Conscience of a Conservative in 1960, and it propelled him toward the nomination in 1964, which of course wasn't successful, but did help to bring a lot more people into an awareness. Right? <clears throat> then we saw the great Senator Robert Taft from Ohio, known and widely respected as Mr. Republican, and he was what you'd call the non-interventionist leader of the 1940s and the 1950s. He was also the precise opposite of a neoconservative. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm honored by your attendance and uh, the good numbers. It's always nice to see. I want to thank Ed Clements and his crew for putting this program together, uh, the people at the book table, and, and then all of you good folks who came. And thank you, Earl, for uh, playing it straight just as I wrote it for you. <laughs> I didn't realize that, that there were, there were going to be some very interesting things happen this week. And obviously, it, it's incumbent upon me to make at least one or two comments. You all know that they got Osama Bin Laden. And, <clears throat> and, and I understand they threw him in the sea. I just got a bullet and Davy Jones threw him back. <laughs> I drove over from Massachusetts and I had an unusual thing happen when I got to the state line. They asked for my birth certificate. <laughs> so I said, you want the long form or the short form? <laughs> now, you've seen this fellow Trump running around now. He's, he's, he's become a birther. Right? Uh, I, I trust him about as far as I can throw this building. But I also wanted to note that he's known as the Donald, hasn't he? Isn't he known as the Donald? Please, God, don't refer to me as the John. <laughs> Ed was good enough to mention John Birch, right? Uh, try to get to know John Birch, a real legitimate American hero. Uh, I got to know his parents, by the way. Right? That was quite a delight. There's a video about John Birch that a fellow put together. He's not a member of the Birch Society. I helped him a little bit, steered him to some people and so forth. And he put together a marvelous program. Now, John Birch came to the attention of America's military. He was already a missionary working in China. Started there in 1940. War broke out in December of 41, as you know. But it had already been in China. The Japanese had invaded and there was war going on between the nationalist Chinese and the, and the Japanese. And <clears throat> early in the war after Pearl Harbor, a bunch of brave Americans led by Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, the famous raid over Tokyo. They weren't going to let the Japs get away with this. They were going to let them know that there's going to be some resistance. And so these men were taking off from way in the South Pacific they were told to go to Japan, drop their bombs, let the Japs know that they weren't going to get away with it. And then because they couldn't fly back to where they'd come from, go to China as far as you can. And when you ran out of fuel, let the plane go and bail out. Now that takes a lot of guts to do something like that. And they did. And so some of them were never seen again. But Doolittle's crew landed and they got together, <coughs> some friendly Chinese herded them into a barge at the side of a river and they were hauled up there wondering if they were ever going to get back to where they wanted to be and somebody knew that John Birch was in town and they went to him and said if you're an American come out I want to talk to you and so he did he went out and he said there's some Americans over there in that barge and he didn't know what they were or who they were but so John went over and he knocked on the door and he said are there any Americans in there well, one of Doolittle's crew members says, don't open it, it's a trap. <laughs> Are there any Americans in there? Don't open it, it's a trap. 
And so John started speaking to them and telling them, you know, I'm, I'm really an American, and da 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 And finally one of Doolittle's crew said, there ain't no Chinese can speak with a southern accent. <laughs> it has to be an American. And so John did bring them out, and General Julie Doolittle told, he was colonel then, told General Clay Chenault about this marvelous American. They sent for him, asked him to join the forces, and he said yes, he'd like to be a chaplain. And Chenault says, I don't need a chaplain, I got a chaplain. I need you, you can speak Chinese, you can live amongst the Chinese. If ever a man deserved the Congressional Medal of Honor, who didn't get it, it was John Birch. But uh, the story, it, it, it wonderful, and it goes on and on. Now I'm going to close with <clears throat> a comment that one, a man who became a very close friend before he died recently, named Joe Sobrand. Joe Sobrand worked for <clears throat> National Review magazine for 21 years until he was betrayed by William Buckley. Uh, I won't go into details on that. But Joe finally got a copy of my book about Buckley, and he just raved about it. I wish I'd known this when I was working for that rascal. Right? So Joe's recently deceased, and uh, <clears throat> I told the people who took care of his funeral that when they put together a headstone, I wanted to contribute to it, and I wanted them to put on what I considered to be Joe Sobrand's most important remark. Right? Joe said at one point, when most politicians wrestle with their conscience, they win. <laughs> Did you get it? <laughs> Isn't that the case? Okay, well we're finally going to get to the talk here. Now we've already gone over some of this, but I'll just repeat it a little bit. What is Americanism? Well, it's very simple. Rights come from our Creator. The government's purpose is to safeguard those rights. We have limited government under the Constitution. We have commerce with all, entanglements with none. That's the way it started. And of course, that last part of it is not being very much adhered to anymore. You got entanglements with everybody. Now, back when I first got involved with the Birch Society, it was quite common that somebody like myself would refer to myself and others as a conservative. Right? Why would we say conservative? Well, there was a book called The Conservative Mind by Russell Kirk. He's really the father of modern conservatism, and he wrote his book in 1942. Then there was Barry Goldwater, who was known as Mr. Conservative. He wrote The Conscience of a Conservative in 1960, and it propelled him toward the nomination in 1964, which of course wasn't successful, but did help to bring a lot more people into an awareness. Right? <clears throat> then we saw the great Senator Robert Taft from Ohio, known and widely respected as Mr. Republican, and he was what you'd call the non-interventionist leader of the 1940s and the 1950s. He was also the precise opposite of a neoconservative. Right? We'll begin to define what a neoconservative is, but he was just the complete opposite. Right? All right, so what is a neoconservative? Well, here's a man who's happily accepted the title of godfather of neoconservatism, Irving Kristol. He was a magazine publisher, a New York City guy. And he delighted in being known as the father of the neoconservative movement. Right. What was the neoconservative movement as far as he was concerned? Well, he wrote this book, The Autobiography of an Idea, Neoconservatism. And he said, we accepted the New Deal in principle and had little affection for the kind of isolationism that then permeated American conservatism. Okay, now. Let's narrow that down a little bit. He accepted the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt, and that's socialism. Okay. Massive government creation, <clears throat> creation of government departments, bureaus, agencies, and it deepened the depression in the 1930s, the New Deal. But this man was in favor of that. Right? 
He was also an opponent of what Robert Welsh was saying as far back as 1934 when he saw what was happening with the New Deal and, and the Roosevelt administration. Robert Welsh wrote an essay called The Weight on My Shoulders and in it he said, my America is being made over into a carbon copy of thousands of despotisms that have gone before. And that's only one sentence out of a, an essay that's certainly worth reading. So Robert Welsh saw it early and he was very concerned about it. But now, Kristol uh, had also said that he didn't like the idea of the isolationism of the Republican Party. I don't know how many times I've been called an isolationist, and I said, no, I'm not an isolationist. I'm a non-interventionist. There's a difference, right? All right? The John Birch Society is not isolationist. Instead, it has always favored non-intervention in the affairs and wars of other nations, and non-intervention with your son, your daughter, and your wallet in those wars. Now, if somebody accuses you of being an isolationist, try to remember, no, I'm a non-interventionist with your son, your daughter, and your wallet, and then you'll have a friend. Because people do re resonate to that. So how, did, uh, how and why did neoconservatism get started? Well, some of you are aware of this famous book, Tragedy and Hope, written by Georgetown professor Carol Quigley way back in 1966. Carol Quigley wrote this 1,300-page book, and he told us in his book that he was aware of a secret society whose purpose was to rule the world, and that its agents in the United States were the Council on Foreign Relations. And he was also the instructor of Bill Clinton at Georgetown University. Bill Clinton later acknowledged that in the speech when he accepted the Democrat nomination in 1992. Now, toward the end of his book, Carol Quigley said this, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. Right? See, at that point, the Republican Party was still the legacy of Robert Taft and Barry Goldwater and Russell Kirk and, and conservatives and so forth. And so Quigley was saying, no, we've got to do away with that. We've got to make the two parties identical. Now, I, I'm sure many of you in this audience realize that you can change from Democrat to Republican and back to Democrat and back to Republican, and there's no change. Right? So what Quigley wanted to see happen has happened. And the ones who were able to do that to the Republican Party were the neoconservatives. Crystal also said, a conservative welfare state is perfectly consistent with the neoconservative perspective. A conservative welfare state? <laughs> How about a glass of dry water? <laughs> well, so you get an idea. I mean, this man was pretty frank. He told you what he thought. He told you what he believed in. So neoconservatism turns out to be socialism at home and international foreign policy, including wars. Right? There's neoconservatism right there. And I didn't make it up. I'm taking it from him. This is what he said. And this is what others have said of the neoconservative persuasion. Now, I'm going to make a point here that may surprise some people. And it is this, that socialism is more deadly than communism. I can remember over the years thinking to myself, well, at least we're not communists. We might be going socialist, but that's not as bad as going communist. No. I've changed my attitude about that. You see, communists seize power swiftly. And when they do, resistance still exists. And hence they have the secret police, the NKVD, the KGB, and whatever else they call it. The socialists seize power by persuading you to vote yourself into the condition and they destroy resistance in the process, which makes it more dangerous. Right? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's happening to our country. Right? The American people are being persuaded to put on the chains of socialism. We've got to stop it. Now, that is a very important point, and I want you to remember that. 
we're going to have an exam before you leave and you'll have to pass. <laughs> so how did the uh, neoconservatives actually get started? Well, they, they admit that they started in 19, 1972. They said with the nomination of George McGovern signified that the Democratic Party was not hospitable to any degree of neoconservatism. Only a few of us drew the obvious conclusion that we would have to try to find a home in the Republican Party. But with every passing year, our numbers grew. Right? Now, if you're old enough to remember the 1972 uh, election and the McGovern forces, it was the, the hippies and the yippies and the, uh, the radicals. And uh, McGovern never said, no, I don't want you on my team. And this drove these people into the Republican Party. And it was a significant thing that happened. So again, go back to neoconservatism is socialism at home and internationalist foreign policy, which includes wars. Crystal later wrote a book, uh, in the same book that we mentioned before. This is significant. He said, I regard myself lucky to have been a young Trotskyite, and I have not one single bitter memory. Trotskyite, right? Who's Trotsky? Well, when Lenin seized control of Russia in 1917, he had a partner. His name was Trotsky. And Trotsky is just as much a criminal as Lenin ever was. Lenin died in 1924, and then Trotsky and Stalin were teammates. So Trotsky and Lenin worked together, and then Trotsky and Stalin, and they had a fallout. We'll get to that too. But now here's a, a, a neoconservative author named John Ehrman, and he said the other important influence on the neoconservatives was the legacy of Trotsky. See, I'm not making this up. I'm taking this from the horse's mouth from these neoconservatives themselves. In the framework of international communism, the Trotskyites were rabid internationalists rather than realists or nationalists. Okay, so the neoconservative movement is socialism, internationalism, and Trotskyism. That says a lot. Here's a chart that was put together, amazingly, in the Washington Post. The Washington Post is a Democrat mouthpiece in the nation's capital. And the Democrat mouthpiece in the na nation's capital did not like neoconservatives. So they put together this chart of all of the neoconservatives. And I don't know if you're close enough to be able to see it, but on the extreme left is Leon Trotsky. And this is the Washington Post, and I didn't make it up. Right? Now, in there you will see uh, all different kinds of famous neoconservatives. I see Gene Kirkpatrick in there, I see Crystal, I see Podoritz, I see uh, Wolfowitz. Right? We could add a lot of these names. And here's the Washington Post not only agreeing, but publishing this chart, which is very instructive. Okay, so let's go back to Leon Trotsky. I already mentioned that he partnered with Lenin, seized Russia in 1917, Lenin died in 1924, and he partnered with Stalin. He had a falling out with Stalin. He was exiled by Stalin in 1927, and he fled to Austria for a while, and then he went someplace else. And he ended up in Mexico, where he was slain by one of Stalin's agents with an ax through his head. Right. Trotsky never ceased working for total government. He just didn't get along with Stalin. Right. Now, here's a man that some of you may remember. Right. I think he was a governor here for a while, wasn't he? Uh, this is something that I would not probably use in a speech if I was in New York State. But way back in the 30s, when Rockefeller Center was being built, young Nelson was given a job by the family to adorn the Rockefeller Center with murals. Well, who did he select to put up the murals? A Mexican communist named Diego Rivera. 
Revere came to New York and he produced fresco paintings depicting Lenin and other communist heroes. And they actually did exist for a time in Rockefeller Center until the family got embarrassed about it and they were removed. Does that say something about Nelson Rockefeller? Well, when Trotsky finally ended up in Mexico, whose home do you think he went to visit and to stay with? Diego Rivera, the artist who had put up the murals of Lenin and other communist heroes. So, and there's a picture of Diego Rivera. Now that's a little sidelight for a New Yorker, right? And Nelson Rockefeller who became a vehement enemy of the John Birch Society, which was as much a good credential as being named by the Southern Poverty Law Center, I guess. <laughs> okay, back to neoconservatives. Who assisted Irving Kristol in the takeover of the Republican Party? Well, we see Richard Barnett, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, he's from New York, wasn't he? Michael Novak, Elliot Abrams, Ben Wattenberg, Midge Dechter, Richard Pearl, Michael Ledeen, Norman Podoritz, William F. Buckley Jr. That comes as a surprise to some people, I'm sure. Robert Bartley, who was the editor of the Wall Street Journal. Right? Now, I'm not going to make this up. I'm going to show you what actually happened here. Here's a copy of my book, and I discovered that after William Buckley graduated from Yale in 1950, he took a job with the, count with the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. They assigned him to Mexico. I don't know that he lived in Diego Rivera's home, but maybe. <laughs> Buckley admitted on numerous occasions that he was working in deep cover. That was his term. He never said what it was. But while he was in Mexico, he authored an article for a Catholic weekly called Commonweal, January 25th, 1952. Again now, he's in the CIA, he's in Mexico, and he's writing this to a Catholic magazine. And what did he say? He said, we have to accept big government for the duration. The instrument of a totalitarian bureaucracy within our shores and the attendant centralization of power in Washington. Neoconservative term had not been invented in 1952, but William Buckley was a neoconservative in 1952. The Buckley team, when he started his magazine in 1955, the initial National Review staff, he had Trotskyite OSS CIA veteran Wilmore Kendall, who had been his professor at Yale. He had Trotskyite OSS CIA veteran James Burnham. He had CIA veteran Priscilla Buckley, his own sister. And he had an ex-communist named Frank Meyer. Now this is supposed to be the conservative publication that's going to stop the drift of our country away from its principles. Right? Well, as one member of the Birch Society finally summarized about Buckley, if he had not done some good, he would not have been positioned to do so much harm. So he did do some good, right? And he started making fun of what was going on in Washington. He started making sport out of it. Right? And Robert Welsh was impressed enough to send him a couple of personal checks to help him along, never realizing that Buckley would turn out to be his arch enemy. Right? But this was the initial team in Buckley. Now there were others who joined the team who saw through it immediately and then bolted. One of them was a man named Medford Evans. Medford Evans walked away from Buckley and went to Robert Welch and wrote for the American Opinion magazine for many years, which is the predecessor of our new American magazine. All right, now how else did these people help the neoconservative movement? Here we have an article in the Wall Street Journal, written by Irving Kristol, the godfather of the neoconservative movement. He said the May 1991 conference that he chaired was sponsored by William Buckley's National Review. 
And most of those attending regarded themselves as conservatives first and Republicans second. By the end of the meeting, a significant reversal had occurred. Most were Republicans first and conservatives second. That was the shift. They had gone from being conservative to being Republican first. They concluded that President Bush, this is Daddy Bush, Papa Bush, I guess we could call him, is now the leader of the conservative movement within the Republican Party. Now he said that in 1991, this was months after the first invasion of Iraq to get them out of Kuwait. Remember that? Right? They called it Desert Storm. Right? And, and George H.W. Bush had told us over and over again that we had to go to war against Iraq because we needed a new world order, didn't he? Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. And I think that what's at stake here is the new world order, a reinvigorated United Nations. <laughs> and that new world order is only going to be enhanced if this newly activated peacekeeping function of the United Nations proves to be effective. Right? You see the internationalism? Right? You go back to the George H.W. Bush's term and you see socialism as well. Right? Here's Joe Sobrand, my friend that I quoted who said most politicians, when they wrestle with their conscience, win. <laughs> he worked for 21 years alongside William Buckley before being unceremoniously dismissed. He, he was betrayed, really. Before he died, he expressed great enthusiasm for my book, Pied Piper for the Establishment, about his former boss and close friend. And I visited with Joe and I said, well, Joe, you read the book through? He says, Jack, I read it twice. And he showed me the book and he showed me all the pages where he dog-eared the, the corner of it and highlighted this and highlighted that. I wish I'd known this all those years. So I certainly recommend the book. He also said, John McManus has gathered together a mountain of damning but firmly documented data about William F. Buckley, Jr. American conservatism's longtime intellectual leader has been a calamity for conservatism. Now that may come hard on some of you. I, I don't know. But all I can say is take a look at the book and I think you'll find that it's all documented, it's all there. All right, now we go back to this William Robert Bartley, editor of the Wall Street Journal. What were some of his attitudes? First of all, he had called Irving Kristol and he said, I want you to write a column occasionally for the Wall Street Journal. And Kristol was very happy to do that, to spread his neoconservative message. Now, one of the more dramatic things that Barclay wrote about one time was during the fight for NAFTA. He said, Mexican President Vicente Fox suggests that NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, should evolve into something like the European Union with open borders. He can rest assured that there is one vo voice north of the Rio Grande that supports his vision, to wit, this newspaper. So the Wall Street Journal was in favor of doing away with the border. See, they were going to solve the immigration problem by doing away with the border. That would have solved it. In Canada, the US, and Mexico would have become one under the North American Union as a step towards creating for the entire Western Hemisphere what has happened in Europe with the European Union, where 27 countries have given up their sovereignty. Right? Well, the John Birch Society, not alone, but led the fight against the North American Union and doing to our country what's been done to the European Union. And we can certainly point to that as a success, at least to date, and we'll keep watching it. Now, these people in the neoconservative movement, they love war. But you know, there are some principles about war that have pretty much gone by the board. I hate to say that, but they have been. In order for there to be a just war, there are numerous things that have to be satisfied. First of all, defensive war alone is legitimate. That's, that's very important. An offensive war is illegitimate. 
All right. Secondly, it must be formally declared by the proper authority. We used to have that in our country. Third, there has to be a just cause and the right intention. Fourth, the last resort, after all else has failed, negotiations, all kinds of meetings, get-togethers and so forth, there's no way of stopping what they are doing to us, okay, then we have to take up arms and defend ourselves. That's a just war. It has to have limited and unchanging objectives. Now you may recall that we started off the war in Iraq because it was something and then it became something else. Look at what happened in Afghanistan. Right? It's now a war to uh, pacify the nation yeah? and to have them adopt America's ways. Who are we to tell them that they should do what we want them to do? No, no. All right? Sixth is a proportionate means, no unlimited war. You may recall that Roosevelt demanded unconditional surrender from Germany and Japan. Not needed not needed. And finally, non-combatants must have immunity. Maybe you know about the firebombing of Dresden by our side. Terrible crime. All kinds of civilians were killed. You may know about the dropping of the A-bomb on Nagasaki and then Hiroshima. It was it first Hiroshima and then Nagasaki? What you probably don't know is that the Japanese tried to surrender in January of 1945. And they presented an entire pr proposal for peace to General MacArthur, who read it over carefully and sent it on immediately to Washington. And Roosevelt put it in the bottom drawer, went to Yalta, sold out Eastern Europe, some parts of Asia. And we dropped the bombs. And finally, the Japanese were permitted to surrender in August, and the terms were exactly what they had offered in January, which means that Iwo Jima didn't have to happen, Okinawa didn't have to happen, the firebombing of, German, of, of Japanese cities didn't have to happen, and the dropping of the A-bombs. I wrote an article about that, and I've been contacted by researchers from some universities around the country, it showed up on Google, I guess, and they wanted to know if I could supply a little more information. I said, well, what is it you want? I think I told you everything I know in the article. The article is conclusive, unfortunately. So there's a just war. Right, now, the, the, the wars that we're involved in right now, do they fit this pattern of just war? No way, no way. There's another term that you'll see occasionally, and that's preemptive war, and that's the type of war that's not defensive, it's an act of aggression. You start it, right? We started a war against Saddam Hussein twice. I'm no fan of Saddam Hussein, right? I do know this, though, that there was a sizable Christian population in Baghdad, maybe a million and a half, two million people. Most of them have fled, right? what used to be a multicultural society. And Saddam Hussein, didn't, he didn't mind that. Leave him alone. Right? Leave him alone. A preemptive war is a type of war started without being attacked or without certain expectation of being attacked. Now who's doing this? Who's doing the preemptive war stuff? Well, that's the, we go back to the, to the uh, neoconservative movement. But we have some historical perspective here. Right? We see that even people like Plato in pre-Christian times, he said when the tyrant has disposed of foreign enemies by conquest or treaty and there's nothing to fear from them, then he is always stirring up some war or other in order that the people may require a leader. Right? Is that going on today? Yeah. Shakespeare in one of his plays had King Henry IV advise his son, Prince Hal, be at thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. Boy, doesn't that say it, huh? How about Alexander Hamilton? The Federalist Papers. He said, safety from external danger is the most powerful director of national conduct. 
The violent destruction of life and property incident to war will compel nations the most attached to liberty to resort for repose and security to institutions which have a tendency to destroy their civil and political rights. Right? To be more safe, they run the risk of being less free. Right? See, I didn't make all this up. This, 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 people throughout history have realized this. And then, of course, we, we go to the project for the new American century. Can I have a show of hands? How many have ever heard of the project for the new American century? Uh, just a smattering. Okay. Project for the New American Century. This was formed after the election in 1992 when George H. W. Bush, the older Bush, was beaten. And his top assistants, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, had already decided, after having engineered the first attack on Saddam Hussein, they wanted to do it again. But they weren't able to do that because Papa Bush lost the election to Bill Clinton. <coughs> courtesy of Ross Perot, by the way. Okay, so the project of the New American Century was formed during the Clinton administration by these people. And they said that we must use U.S. power to meet global responsibilities. No. We don't have global responsibilities. We have responsibilities to the American people. Right? What is the purpose of our military force? It's to protect the lives, liberty, and property of the people who pay the bills for it. That's all. Not to meet global responsibilities. Right? Well, the project for the new American century said, strengthen ties to allies, challenge regimes hostile to our values. Challenge regimes hostile to our values. That's preemptive wars. Insist on political and economic freedom abroad. In other words, force others to adopt our ways instead of persuading them that this would be a better thing to do. Force them. Insist. And then extend an international order. World government. This was the project for the new American century, 1997. All right, now who were the people? Project for the new American century signatories. Dick Cheney. Donald Rumsfeld, Elliot Abrams, Paul Wolfowitz, Jeb Bush, the younger of the brothers, Midge Dector, Steve Forbes, Norman Podoritz, William Bennett, Dan Quayle, Frank Gaffney. These are people that signed on to this project for the new American century. This was a neoconservative triumph of immense proportions. So, the path to war. Rumsfeld, Cheney, and Wolfowitz wanted Bush 1 to invade Afghani Iraq again in 1992. I already mentioned that. So out of office in 93, they formed the PNAC. They petitioned Clinton and Gingrich, who was then Speaker of the House, to invade Iraq. Well, Clinton got himself tied up with some uh, personal matters. <laughs> Wasn't able to do it. But they came back in office with Bush 2, in the year 2001, after the long, drawn-out election results, right? Remember the hanging chads and all that stuff, right? All right? They urged the invasion of Iraq before 9-1-1. They had it all ready to go. They were looking for an excuse. After 9-1-1, they had their excuse. And what they were doing is what Ram Emanuel said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. The crisis was 9-1-1. Now, there are people that I have read and looked at over the years who want to blame the U.S. government for 9-1-1. And the John Birch Society has never adopted that view. If anybody could prove it, we would say it. Nobody's proven it to us. But there are some people with some very extreme and loud voices. We don't buy it. Right? Now here's a book that was written by a man named Robert Higgs, Crisis and Leviathan, Critical Episodes in the Growth of American Government. And he made the point that 20th century national emergencies, mainly wars, depressions, and labor disturbances, 
have prompted federal officials to take over previously private rights and activities. Who was it that were doing this? It's the neoconservatives. So George W. Bush became president in 2001. He selected neocons Cheney and Rumsfeld as his topmost assistants. He obtained authorization to invade Afghanistan and Iraq from the Constitution of the United States. No, 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 no. From the United Nations. He started forcing U.S. values on other peoples and other nations. More socialism at home, steadily escalating indebtedness. Right? Right? Sometimes people want to say that Barack Obama is horrible. He's got us up to $13 trillion of indebtedness. Well, this man brought us to 12. Uh, it's, it's like what Carol Quigley said, 1966, the two parties should be the same so that we can throw the rascals out at any occasion and, and not have any change. Uh, Ed Clements has already mentioned the New American article that I wrote called Neocon Control. A lot of what I've talked about here is in that article. But at the annual CPAC convention held in Washington every year, they gave the Defender of the Constitution Award to Donald Rumsfeld. He might have been a conservative, but he was a neoconservative. Was he a constitutionalist? No way. He's a neocon, not a conservative. Okay, now we go to another neoconservative writer named Mark Gerson. He says, the neoconservatives have so changed conservatism that what we now identify as conservatism is largely what was once neoconservatism. And in so doing, they have defined the way vast numbers of Americans view their economy, their polity, and their society. Right? And he's happy about that. But that's a good summation about what has happened. There's no doubt about that. That has happened. So what are we in the John Birch Society? Are we neoconservative? No. Are we conservative? Not anymore. Are we constitutionalist? Always. There's the distinction. For an American, it's not an amorphous conservatism that changes. And the man who changed it more than anyone was William Buckley, and he continued to move it to the left. Right? That's all documented. The standard for Americans is the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration that preceded it. There's the standard for America. Sam Francis was another man that was betrayed by William Buckley, a friend of Joe Sobran. And he at one time said the whole concept of conservatism in America is virtually devoid of meaning, in large part because conservatives made the seminal error of allowing dilettantes like Mr. Buckley to define it for them in the first place. Absolutely right on target. He said that in 1993. He's passed away too. Now what are some neoconservative publications? Well, commentary, and I would guess people in this room don't know most of these publications. The public interest was Crystal's magazine, Irving Crystal, but that was pre-2005 and it went out of business. The national interest was then started, not just the public interest. The Weekly Standard is now the big uh, neoconservative journal, and that's headed by Irving Crystal's son, William Crystal. National Review Magazine has become a neoconservative organ, no doubt about it. When Foreign Affairs, of course, is the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, and then you have to throw in the Wall Street Journal. Now, some of these publications will occasionally publish something that you like, and something I might even like. It's like throwing a little bit of bait to somebody to get them to take on more of the other program. Prominent neoconservatives who hold membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, Charles Krauthammer, Elliot Abrams, Newt Gingrich, Condoleezza Rice, Henry Kissinger, Robert Kagan, Rupert Murdoch, who now owns the Wall Street Journal, John McCain, John Bolton. John McCain? Yeah, John McCain? John McCain wants troops on the, on, the, on the ground in Libya today. He's a man a while ago 
he actually came out with a song, Bomb, Bomb, Bomb Iran. He wanted to expand the war into Iran. No, thank you. More preemptive war? No, thank you. Now, if you want the comprehensive history of the Council on Foreign Relations, I couldn't recommend anything more than the book, The Shadows of Power. And I won't say anything more about that except to say that if somebody came to me and said, where can I read about the problem and what's going on in this country, there's the book I would send them to. All right, here's William Crystal now. He's the son of the Godfather. So I don't know what you'd call the son of the Godfather. The Godson, I guess. I don't know. Considered a conservative. Wants to expand the Mideast war to Iran. He's been very open about that. He's the editor of the Neocon Weekly Standard. He was the chairman of the project for the New American Century, which is now defunct, so they started another organization. It's been replaced by the Neocon's Foreign Policy Initiative, and Crystal is the leader of that. It's carrying on the same, the same goal. Well, here's a man that some of you probably know or have heard about, Ron Paul, congressman from Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Ron Paul said, neoconservatism is not the philosophy of free markets and a wise foreign policy. Instead, it represents big government welfare at home and a program of using our military might to spread their version of American values throughout the world. Good for you, Ron. Right on. Thursday, I'll be in Greenville, South Carolina, where there will be the first GOP debate for the presidency, the nomination of the Republican Party. I have press credentials. <laughs> There'll be a Tea Party meeting that afternoon, and I'll be a speaker at that, and then I'll go to the, the thing. <clears throat> and Ron, Ron Paul will be there. I have no idea who else will be. Wouldn't surprise me if Trump showed up. <laughs> the Donald. <laughs> okay, here's a point I made earlier, and I put it back here, I want to make it again. Socialism more deadly than communism. Communists seize power swiftly, resistance still exists, which is why they have secret police, NKVD, KGB, gulags, all that stuff, right? Socialists seize power slowly by persuading you to vote yourself into the condition and resistance is gone. So important to realize that. And the second of these alternatives is what is happening to our country. World government. All neoconservatives want world government. They may have minor disagreements among themselves, but they all favor continued U.S. subservience to the United Nations. There's no doubt about that. What should be the attitude of the U.S. government? Well, look at George Washington said it. The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is extending our commercial relations to have with them as little as political connection as possible. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president. America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. Wouldn't you love to see that today? Robert Welsh, John Bursa say, what did he say? He said, what would be wrong with simply minding our own business? <laughs> yeah. right. Ron Paul, who's become quite a good friend, personally and organizationally, the John Birch Society is a great patriotic organization featuring an education program solidly based on constitutional principles. Right? Thank you, Ron. You're right. We are based on solid constitutional principles. Now here's his son. His son has recently come out. His son is the leader of the Tea Party, as you probably know. He's written a book now about the Tea Party. Right? He said the Tea Party does not seek to simply go back to the Bush years when the debt was a mere 12 trillion as opposed to 13 trillion. Nor does the Tea Party seek simply to return to the same old Republican rhetoric where limited government was promised but never delivered, the Constitution was referenced but never followed, and the Founding Fathers were quoted but never heeded. Good for you, Rand. <laughs> I've gotten to know him a little bit too. I've spoken on programs with him before he became a senator. I wonder if he'd still want, to, want me around, I don't know. 
Okay, enough of the problem, folks. What's the solution? What do we do? The quote there in yellow is by a man named John McManus. Right? We take our country back through the House of Representatives. Do not expect to steal the presidency. Okay. Why do I say that? Because Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution says, all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. The power of the purse is in the House. If the House of Representatives will not initiate a bill to fund a foreign war, or the Department of Education, housing, transportation, medicine, health, you name it, that's it. You see the power of the purse, right? They could even stop foreign aid. Imagine that. I went to a fourth grader recently and I said, if you're heavily in debt, should you give away money? He said, no, of course not. I said, how would you like to run for Congress? <laughs> Problem is that he couldn't pass the age requirement. He could pass the good sense requirement. Imagine, we give away money. The United States right now is the most heavily indebted nation in the history of mankind. They admit to close to $14 trillion of indebtedness. Ladies and gentlemen, if you added it all up, you're close to $200 trillion. The John Birch Society offers rock solid information. Now there are other groups that put out good information. They stop there. We have five decades of experience. There's nobody else has that. We have a sorely lead needed national organization. And I can't stress that more. Organization is so key. See, if the John Birch Society says, hey, look, they want, they want to merge Canada, the US, and Mexico. We've got to alert our people. Right? And just like that, we got people in every state in the Union alerting others about this possible North American Union. Who else can do that? Nobody else can do that. Organization is so... Organization, we, we go to people and they say, look, put your, put your faith and your trust in, in, in the organization of the John Birch Society and don't everybody go off in 75 different ways. 75 different battles. There's all kinds of battles that can be fought every single day and nobody will get anywhere if you don't have an organized effort coast to coast. So we have the rock solid information, we have the five decades of experience, we have the sorely needed national organization, and we have a plan for victory. I don't think there's any other organization that even comes close to providing all of that. Which of course is why I recommend the Birth Society. Less government, more responsibility, with God's help, a better world. How much less government? How about the Constitution? The Constitution were fully enforced, the federal government would be 20% its size and 20% its cost. Wouldn't that be nice? When I was in Montana not long ago, and I said that during a speech, and a guy came up to me, and he must have been this big, <laughs> and he looked down at me and he said, you said 20%, how about five? I said, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. More responsibility? Where do we go to find out that? How about the Ten Commandments? Most of which are being violated. Not only by individuals, but by our government. That combination, with God's help, only because we deserve it, would lead to a better world. Robert Welsh, at the end of the founding meeting, and then many, many other meetings, he just simply said, come join us in our proud companionship and in our epic undertaking, which is the way I'll end this and say thank you very much for your close attention. God bless America. <laughs>